So, uh, thank you very much. And good morning, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Thomas, for the very nice introduction. And thank you for having me here today. I'm really stoked about being in this great location for a conference, first time, hope not to be the last one. When I was invited to this workshop, it was made extremely clear to me that we have a very specific topic here. And the topic is, that work would be really great. Yep. Yep, great. The topic is the ultra-fast antiferromagnetic writing. Now, let me state just right off the bat that in my opinion, this is one of the major goals of the entire research field of ultra-fast magnetism. However, I do not think this to exhaust the entire field. So that means that, in my opinion, I really believe there are other concepts that should be investigated, deserve to be investigated. We have to work us in other directions. However, that's the topic of today. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, if you want to discuss the ultra-fast antiferromagnetic writing, there is something missing on my slide. What is missing here is, pardon? Hmm. No. What is missing here is this very nice, big and fat question mark. I don't think I'm insulting anybody's work when I say that up to today, we haven't realized yet an ultra-fast antiferromagnetic writing. I would like to start by pointing out a couple of concepts that at least in my opinion are milestones. So really very crucial steps or concepts that we really need to employ to work towards this goal. And the first word that I would like to bring up is coherence. If you do anything in a coherent way, you're going to achieve your result, minimizing in a brutal way the dissipations of energy. Second, you've got to drive spin dynamics into a nonlinear regime. As long as you stick into a linear regime of spin dynamics, you can drive harmonic, coherent oscillations of spins, and you can do beautiful physics with that. But that regime is very unlikely to be helpful if you want to strive to achieve the writing. If you want to, for instance, switch the order parameter, you need no linearities. And I think it's, the program was built up in a very nice way because it's uh, the talk of Ross's lab just before me introduced the kind of nonlinearities I want to discuss. I would like to talk about coupling of the modes. Now, as Thomas said in his introduction, what I do mean here is having an input at a frequency omega one matching the frequency of a magnet in a given material. And then observing an output at a frequency omega two with match, which matches, pardon, the frequency of another magnum mode. The frequency mixing is the definition of nonlinearity. I would like to say right in the beginning that however, the reason or the way we are going to do this is different than what Ross's lab discussed. Because in our experiments, these polaritonics effects are not relevant. We pump magnums in a different way. So I would like then to start to talk about this, uh, introducing the material, because if you want to, study the coupling of the modes, you have to choose a proper material. The material that we studied is so famous that I'm not going to spend even a single word describing it because we work on nickel oxide. Yes, roughly 10 years ago, Professor Sato demonstrated that we can optically pump and probe different magnum modes. So in his data, there are oscillations at frequency of 110 gigahertz, roughly low frequency mode and oscillations at the frequency of one tera high frequency mode. They correspond to two different magnetic modes at the center of the Brillouin zone. The dispersion of the nickel oxide is split in the center of the Brillouin zone because of several interactions. Now, the question that I would like now to bring up is whether these two modes can be coupled. At the first glance, it doesn't make any sense because we all know that we can take, we can write down the Heisenberg Hamiltonian of the material, diagonalize it, solve it, getting the eigenstate with eigenfrequencies, which are the magnum modes, and they are orthogonal. Orthogonal, first of all, in the Hilbert space. But in this particular case, they're kind of orthogonal also in real space. Um, what I do mean by that is if you consider the direction along which the order parameter oscillates when you drive these magnum modes, these two directions are orthogonal to each other. In the case of the low frequency mode, the nil vector is oscillating in a plane. In the case of the high frequency mode, the nil vector is oscillating out of plane. So at the moment, please, let's keep the question there. We are going to answer this in a few moments. 
I would like now to introduce the way we drive magnons in this case in nickel oxide. I mean, just for the record, you can drive in nickel oxide magnons in any possible way. We have discussed yesterday in passive stimulated drama or inverse Faraday effect, call it however you want. It's a possibility. Another possibility is pumping resonantly using terahertz pulses, very similar to what Rostislav explained us in the previous talk. I'm going to use a different approach. And what I'm going to do here is relying on the transition voilà, that is called exciton magnum. I'm going to introduce this concept from the standpoint of an experimentalist. So what I'm going to show you is the absorption spectrum of nickel oxide in the spectral regime please, below the band gap. So you have this feature here comprising a peak A and a sideband B. This feature appears in the spectrum of a lot of the electric antiferromagnet. So this is not just a nickel oxide story. Uh, it appears always in the spectral range below the band gap. And the canonical interpretation of this feature relies on the idea that A represents an electronic transition, spin forbidden, and B, a sideband magnonic in origin. This interpretation stems from the data. If we now take the energy of A and B and we calculate the difference, this matches the energy of a magnum mode in this material. Now, we repeat the experiment changing temperature, and we observe that the sideband B has shifted. Again, the difference between A and B matches the energy of the same magnum mode at the newly established value of temperature. That's why the sideband B is interpreted as magnonic in origin. Now, the really traditional and canonical interpretation of the exciton magnum, therefore, relies on two simultaneous processes. Uh, the first process is the excitation of an electronic transition spin forbidden delta S one. Simultaneously, a magnet is generated delta S minus one, so that overall the spin conservation is restored. And overall, you can drive this transition with the electric field of light. So the electric field of light is here relevant. We are talking about an electric dipole transition. Please notice that the original paper explaining or even deriving a theory for the exciton magnet dates back to 1965. So I'm not saying that there's a brilliant idea that I had myself. I'm reading old papers and try to understand if they're relevant when we talk about ultra fast spin dynamics. The exciton magnet turns out to be extremely relevant on the ultra short time scale. And the reason for that is that the spectral range where it is observed is near infrared. Very easy for modern laser technology. Even if you buy a super commercial laser system, you can generate and control your laser pulses in the spectral regime in a very nice way. But in this way, we can resonantly pump magnons. In nickel oxide, the magnon mode involved here is a magnon at the center of the Brillouin zone. But in another material or in other materials, even magnons at the edges of the Brillouin zone can be involved. Now, why is this relevant now? The frequency of these magnons are huge. The time scale, therefore, are very short. The shortest available in the dispersion of the material. Optically, you can't drive this mode in any other way because the wave vector of light is zero. The wave vector of these magnets is huge. So if you want to drive individual magnets near the edges of the Brillouin zone in a resonant way, and you want to do it on the ultra short time scale, there is no other way to do it. And now we can imagine, or we can think about what, does, what that does imply for the magnetic structure. A magnet is a perturbation of the ground state. Now we can pump a lot of them because we pump resonantly, and we can pump the magnets that imply the shortest possible time scale of spin dynamics. So the way we decided a few years ago to explore this concept is rather a brute force method. So we took this material because it shows in the phase diagram two magnetic phases. So we cooled down the sample just below the transition temperature, and we resonantly drove these high energy magnets. Because the question was, okay, we are perturbing so massively, so quickly the ground state. Is that enough to drive the phase transition? And in that case, how fast can that happen? It turned out that it is enough, and it turns out that the phase transition can be driven in 600 femtoseconds. So in 600 femtoseconds, you generate a completely new magnetic state, which lives on a time scale of several nanoseconds. The reason for that, the reason, the reason why this takes place on such a short time scale is that the time scale is set by the high energy magnets. Again, the shortest time scale in your magnetic system. That's really a brute force experiment. What I suggest to do with nickel oxide is something slightly more elegant. 
which means that I would like to be able to drive spin dynamics pumping either resonantly or off resonantly this transition. And now to see what that implies for our magnetic system. So the experiment is a magnet optical pump probe experiment in which the pump photon energy can be tuned in the spectral range of the exciton magnum. We did that in collaboration with Stefano Bonetti in his lab uh, in Stockholm. So let me start by showing you just a few time traces selected that we did measure in the spectral range of the exciton magnum. Now, in all the data set, you see this low oscillation at the frequency of 130 gigahertz, which matches the low frequency mode. But in some data traces or in some time traces, you can observe a faster ripple on top of this low oscillation. Here, the ripple can be seen. Here, no. This data set is extremely smooth. We can get a much deeper and better insight into the data if we look at them in the frequency domain. So if we fully transform, just as a title of example, these two traces, we obtain that in the case of this very smooth data set, sure enough, there is no high frequency contribution to the spectrum of the data. But if you then look at the spectrum of the data, in the case where you have this faster ripple, a terahertz contribution, to be more precise, 1.07 terahertz contribution to the spectrum can be detected. And that's exactly the frequency of the high frequency magnum. Now, evidently, we measure for many more pump photon energies. So now we can basically plot the amplitude of the two magnum modes as a function of the excitation photon energy. And that's exactly the plot that I would like to show you right now. Voila. So photon energy intensity of the terahertz magnum. For the sake of discussion, I'm going to show you also the absorption spectrum of nickel oxide. Now, if you do pump off resonantly, you see nothing. Fair enough. If you pump resonantly, you see high frequency magnums. OK, please notice that this exit of magnum is very narrow spectrally. Our laser pulses aren't. They are ultra short. They are broadband, as broad as this blue box. So basically, we do not observe exactly this profile. Is this profile convoluted with our spectral resolution? Uh, I mean, or the width of our uh, spectral laser pulses. If you increase again the photon energy even further, you can still observe terahertz magnus, but the amplitude is reduced. And the reason for that is that we are pumping the transition that I call here PS1 and PS2. They are phonon sidebands of the excitons. If you pump phonon sidebands of the exciton, you're still pumping the exciton and the exciton magnus. But now you are in a way wasting energy to the lattice. So the efficiency of driving spin dynamics and magnets is reduced. The amplitude goes down. If you again go even farther and you pump up resonance, you see nothing. So, okay, I'm showing you a resonant drive of magnets. Please do not think that this drive is purely dissipated in origin. If you consider an effect that is purely dissipated, the stronger the absorption, the stronger the effect. That's not the case here, because if we consider the experiments performed in correspondence of the highest value of the absorption spectrum, of the absorption coefficient, pardon, we do not observe the maximum signal. We observe roughly 60% of the maximum. What is important here, so the figure of merit is not how much the material absorbs light, but the nature of the transition. You want to see terahertz magnets, you've got to drive, in this case, the exciton magnet. That's fine. What was a bit less fine and way more problematic for us is the spectral dependence of the low frequency mode. That gets amplified as well. And that's a problem. That's a problem because this is in striking disagreement with the literature. A few years ago, we performed a conceptually similar experiment in a material in which there is no exciton magnum. So we changed back then the, pho the photon energy of the pump beam below the band gap, and we observed for any photon energies coherent magnum. The amplitude of these magnets do not depend on the pump photon energy, because basically at, at the time it was very easy to understand. There is no reason why there is no resonance. There is no reason why the amplitude of the magnet should change. Clearly, that's not what is going on in nickel oxide. So now we have to try to understand what is going on. The very first thing that we consider is that also the low frequency mode is involved in the exciton magnet. Unfortunately, we can neither confirm nor disprove this experimentally for a matter of spectral resolution. We can use something that is just slightly less valuable than data. And I'm talking about uh, symmetry analysis and group theory. Basically, the symmetry of the high frequency mode is the same symmetry of the excitonic transition. That's why they can couple. The symmetry of the low frequency mode is completely different. They cannot couple. Now, uh, 
if you don't speak the language of group theory, which I don't speak myself, uh, we can understand that the symmetries are different just if we consider how the nil vector is oscillating when we drive the magnets. It's oscillating along orthogonal directions. So it is not so surprising that the symmetries of the two magnet modes in this case are really different. Now, second possibility, a lattice mode is involved in the frequency mixing and the coupling between magnets. We looked into that and we couldn't find a proper phonon. With proper, I mean a phonon with the right frequency to enable the frequency mixing and the proper wave vector so that in this process, the wave vector can be conserved. We have then to consider something that I haven't mentioned so far and usually is kind of neglected when we talk about ultrafast spin dynamics. Our material is a single crystal that we bought. We just purchased that commercially. Our material is in a multi-domain state. There are S domains and P domains in nickel oxide. Uh, Christian demonstrated a few years ago that we can forget about S domains when we measure magneto optics. So we just work with T domains or we consider T domains. I think T domains were introduced yesterday already by Ellen. So I don't need to uh, tell you how they look like, but I would like to mention how we think T domains play a major role in our experiment. First of all, I would like to do it in a very pictorial way showing you a cartoon. So we know that when we pump our material, we excite high frequency magnets because we pump the exciton magnet. For the sake of argument, let's assume that we do so in a domain that we call T1. Now magnets can propagate clearly and spins in a domain T1 can interact with the wall. And then the problem is shifted. The problem is shifted to calculate the spectrum of the domain wall. We solve this problem. Actually, she solved the problem, I <laughs> solved it myself. And the spectrum of the walls turned out to be super complicated because you have a lot of solutions propagating, localized. And this complexity comes from the fact that nickel oxide is magnetoelastic in nature. But this was already discussed yesterday. Out of all the possible solutions, there is a localized mode with the frequency such that the mixing between the two magnet modes is possible. But now we know that spins in motion in the wall can interact with spins in the domain T2 because of exchange interaction and the interface. So this solution of the domain wall can kick spins in the domain T2 at different frequencies is not the only process. And one of the scattering process can result in the generation of low frequency magnet in the domain T2. You have already seen yesterday that you can formalize this description. Uh, you can use the generalized equation of motions for spin dynamics and antiferromagnets and plug in as a source term what we do with light. So driving high frequency magnets in the domain T1. You solve the equation of motion in the domain uh, two. And then in particular, you want to know how the amplitude of the low frequency magnet in the domain T2 depend, if it depends at all, on the magnets that we photoinduce in the domain T1. It turns out that there is a coupling between these two quantities. And this was discussed yesterday. All the details of the theory are found in the separate publication. Now, I show you a cartoon. I show you a sneak peek of the theory that Helen derived. The next thing that I can show you to convince you that this mechanism is responsible for the observation is a control experiment. Ideally, we would like to be able to repeat everything we have done in a single domain state. Now, you can't make the entire sample in a single domain state unless you have access to hundreds of Tesla, probably. But what can be done in nickel oxide is an annealing process that results in making the domains big enough that you can focus your laser spots, pump and probe inside a single domain. We didn't have access to this kind of uh, uh, technology, I would say. So we teamed up with Professor Takuya Sato. He sent us a sample already annealed, and then we could perform our control experiment expecting to observe an amplification of the high frequency mode because the exit of magnon is always there and expecting no amplification of the low frequency mode. According to what we suggest, no walls, no way to amplify the low frequency magnon. And sure enough, that's what we observe, which further, and I would say ultimately, corroborates the explanation that we put forward to interpret our data. Now, what we demonstrated with this experiment is that domain walls are not necessarily nuisance they can somehow also enable functionalities that in a single domain are not there. Because in a single domain, again, there is no way to couple these two modes, probably except we do something that uh, what Ross's level was discuss discussing previously, but that entails another excitation mechanism, another spectral range. Now, 
uh, I show you that if you rely on this hybrid excitation mechanism of charge and spins, the exciton magnons, you can photoinduce a magnetic phase transition in less than a picosecond, amplify and couple magnum modes. Fine. Um, I have had a lot of collaborators working on this and on other things we are doing. So I really want to acknowledge them. And of course, acknowledge the funding agencies. And typically that's where I conclude my talk. But since it's our first conference after a very long time, I want to do something really unusual. Um, and I want to show you what in my opinion is the next, the next thing can be in this story of coherent linear spin dynamics, a coupling of the modes. I believe that one of the possible next thing is taking a femtosecond laser pulse and now, oh, it's coming, and now pumping resonantly pairs of magnets at the edges of the brilliant zone. Why? Long, long time ago, it was predicted that if you can do that properly, you are going in the transient state to renormalize the entire dispersion, which means that in the transient state, you generate a different magnetic materials. Additionally, it is predicted that if you do this properly, you will be able at a certain point to drive K0 magnets, which are excited because they couple with zone edge magnets. And if you are able to observe this, the spectrum of K0 magnets is going to look like completely different than what it usually looks like. Frequency and damping are going to be different because it's an instability of the magnetic system. I think is uh, insanely cool. And I think also that uh, uh, I think I'm really glad we are actively working in this direction. So I hope that in the coming months or probably next year, I will be able to tell you more about that. So if you're interested in that, you just have to wait a little bit and stay tuned. Thank you very much for the attention.